again, thank y'all for being a part of these kingdom family study. So I'm going to do some house cleaning here. Uh, I want you to make sure you check your mics uh, and make sure that they're muted so that we don't get any feedback. Uh, let you know these sessions are recorded. So please take a look right now at your, at your page and find out and see if you're muted. And if not, go ahead and mute your microphone so that we don't get any feedback, okay? There will be an opportunity for you to ask uh, any Bible questions you might have about the Word of God, okay? Uh, again, we're going to be in Psalms 127 is where we're going to start. Just a few moments. Psalms 127 is where we're going to start. And uh, we're going to ask uh, Brother Coffee. I'm going to ask him if he doesn't mind uh, to give us an opening prayer and to get us started with our study for tonight. Uh, Brother Coffee. Let, let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for another day, for another opportunity, Father, to gather uh, to gather together with the saints. We thank you, Father, for keeping us safe throughout this day, Father. We can come together with a ready mind to look at another portion of your word. We thank you, Father, for your manservant, Father, who has taken the time to study your word, Father, to teach us what your word says to us, saith the Lord. And we just pray, Father, that the things that he studied will come back to his remembrance, Father, to teach us in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that we will pray our minds to re receive what you have prepared for those things which are written. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins and cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. And we thank you and ask these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Coffee. Again, I'm going to ask you to mute your mics if you are not speaking. I'm going to go ahead and put mute on the ones whose mics are not muted. Okay, brothers and sisters, tonight I want to speak on the subject of being a watchman in the family. Being a watchman in the family. In Psalms 127, I want to read verse 1. Where the Bible says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And so now when we read this psalm, this psalm is as a psalm of Solomon. Uh, many of you know Solomon was the son of David, and Solomon was a man who was very familiar with, with family. And so when Solomon uh, writes, he, he lets us know the vanity of building your life without God in the equation, trying to build your family without God uh, at the apex of your home. And so what he's given us in this psalm, he's given us four components of family in this psalm. He's given us the components of building a home is, first of all, is building. Uh, when you look at verse number one, he says, except the Lord build the house. That's a component of the family. A component of the family is to build the family. All of us are building a family. And then the second component of the family is we are to keep or guard the family. You see that with me in verse one? He says, except the Lord keep uh, the city. In other words, unless the Lord guard the city. He says, the watchman wicked but in vain. And so there's a component of building. There's the component of, of guarding. But then there's also the component of enjoying your family. See, when you look at verse number two, he said, it's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. And so when you have God involved in the family, it brings a component of enjoyment. Without God, it's sorrow. But with God in the family, you can enjoy a healthy family life. And then verses 3 through 5 actually deals with the component of persevering or preserving the family. So when you have a godly family, you have to understand it is components of building, guarding, enjoying, and persevering or preserving the family. When you have a family that God leads, then it preserves uh, your children and your children's children when we do it the way God wants us to do it. Now, uh, out of these four components tonight, I just want to deal with one. And the component I want to deal with tonight is the component of guarding the family. This is why I, I titled this being a watchman. Uh, I want us to be able to, to guard our families from the enemy. Uh, because I know we're not strangers to the fact that uh, Satan is busy trying to destroy homes. 
And I am one that advocates, so goes the home, so goes the church. Without a, a God-fearing family, uh, there is no God-fearing church or a God-fearing government. Uh, because to have church government requires elders and deacons, uh, which elders and deacons have to have godly homes, godly families, to be able to teach other families and lead other families the way God would have them to lead. And so what Satan is busy doing, uh, he's busy trying to attack the family, the home. Uh, because that's where it starts. And so all of us need to be, we need to be watchmen in the family. Now, when we look at this word watchman, let's have the same definition on watchman. Here's what I want you to understand. The definition of watchman, what is it? Here we go. It's to peer into the distance. It is to lean forward. It's to observe. It means to await. It's the idea of standing on the wall. So if the enemy was approaching... What you can do if you're a watchman, you can give proper warning to your family so that they can prepare themselves also. That's what a watchman did. A watchman would look down the road, would, would look ahead uh, for the enemy. And if the enemy coming this way, this is what, what watchman did so that not only that he could be prepared, but so that the others uh, who are behind his leadership uh, in his home uh, can also be prepared. Let me give you an example of that. Go back to 2 Samuel 18. Here's an example in David's day. 2 Samuel chapter 18 of a good watchman. Remember, David, King David had enemies. You know, and some of his enemies were his own family members. Absalom, one of his sons, uh, revolted against him and turned against him. Well, so David, on many occasions, uh, he would have to run for his life, you know, to protect his life. And so what David would do at times, uh, uh, he would run for his life. And, uh, but what he would do is he would put a watchman, uh, someone on the wall, to look down the road to see if the enemy was in fact coming. In 2 Samuel 18 and verse 24, 2 Samuel 18 and verse 24, here's just one occasion. Again, this is a good watchman here. In 2 Samuel 18 verse 24, and David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof, over the gate, unto the wall, lifted up his eyes, and looked and behold a man running along and the watchman cried and told the king and the king said if he be alone there is tidings in his mouth and he came a pace and drew near and the watchman saw another man running and the watchman called unto the porter and said behold another man running alone and the king said he also bring your tidings and the watchman said me thinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zion, and the king said that he is a good man and come in with good tidings. And so I wanted to read those verses to show you what a good watchman does. A good watchman looked down the road and he sees someone coming and he, he lets the king know. And so you and I are to be watchmen in our family. We are to be watchmen in our home. Now, what are some things we need to be watching for? I'm going to give you four and then I'll be done. Four things, and this is not an exhaustive list, but I think it's an important list. Uh, if we're going to have a, a godly home, then we're going to be watchmen for our families. These are some things I just wrote down that I believe are necessary to understand. I told you that prior time. I get up Because we deal, we deal with a, 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 I deal with a lot of people in counseling, and so these are a lot of things that I see. Uh, with the people that I often sit down with in, in, in the office. And number one, uh, the enemy we need to look out for is unresolved anger. Unresolved anger. Now, I think we understand this. Anger isn't always wrong. Uh, I, I, uh, Jesus got angry. Uh, when I'm talking about unresolved anger, we're talking about people who get angry and they're angry for the wrong reason. See, because God got angry. Matter of fact, Psalm 7 and 11, turn there with me. God is angry every day with the wicked. When you look at Psalm chapter 7 and verse number 11 of your Bible, Psalm 7 and verse number 11. So one of the enemies is unresolved anger, but, but anger in and of itself, uh, it, it, it can be good. It, 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 it's beneficial. It's helpful uh, for us to be what God wants us to be. But I'm talking about unresolved anger, an anger that is unrighteous. See, God gets angry. God judging the righteous, Psalm 711. And God is angry with the wicked, the Bible says, every day. 
And so God himself gets angry with wickedness and evilness. But the anger that I'm talking about is an unrighteous anger. A, a person who is, is, has this unrighteous anger, who has issues and problems, and they don't resolve the anger uh, or deal with the thing that's causing them to be angry. And that destroys a lot of families. Unresolved anger, bottling stuff up, holding things in, not dealing with the issue have destroyed and is destroying a lot of families, a lot of homes. It was the problem in the first family. They go back to Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve, the first family. You remember after, after they sinned, uh, sin entered into the world. And then we look at Genesis chapter 4, they end up, uh, Adam and Eve end up having children. And they had Cain and they had Abel. Well, we go back to Genesis chapter 4. What happened here in this text? Well, God did not accept Cain's offering because Cain did not offer to God what God would have him to offer. But his brother Abel, in fact, offered the right thing. And so what happened in verse number uh, 4 of Genesis chapter 4, the Bible says, let's start with 5, Genesis 4, 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. God didn't have respect for Cain's offering. And Cain, look at this, he was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why are you wroth? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at your door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. You know what God has just told Cain? You have a choice about this situation. You have a choice about this matter. You can deal with this anger. There's something you can do about how you feel right now. Cain has a choice, is what God is saying. If you do well, you'll be better. But if you don't do well, if you don't rule over this, it's going to rule over you. So you need to resolve your issue. You need to fix your problem. But of course, we know the story. He doesn't deal with it. He doesn't fix his problem. So what happens in verse number 8? And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of your brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And so because Cain didn't deal with his anger, he ends up murdering his brother. Brothers and sisters, what I'm telling you and friends on this on this Zoom call tonight, unresolved anger is always a recipe for disaster. It's always a recipe for disaster. When you don't deal with your problems, your issue, your anger to resolve it, it leads to disaster. It's an enemy. It's an enemy. And there's a lot of unhappy homes, a lot of unhappy families because of unresolved anger. Now understand, we all live in families where we have disagreements. When you get two sinful people in a sinful world who have passions for certain things, uh, there's going to be disagreements, and you be passionate about your uh, disagreements. But the thing you and I better understand is we better learn how to uh, work these issues out to deal with the anger that you might have. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'll open up the questions and when I'm done. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul Write something here to the Christians in Ephesus. And we've heard many times, I'm sure if you're a member of the Lord's Church, he writes something in the negative, and then he writes something in the positive. And he he's in chapter 4 and verse number 31. Listen at this. He gives some negatives, and then he gives some positives about this unresolved anger. He says in Ephesians 4 and verse number 31, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice now one of the things i've found and this is just me from my experience over the years being a gospel preacher teacher is that a lot of us we know what the scripture says but our problem is we don't know the meaning 
of a lot of the things it says, the words. See, we, we can quote scriptures, and, and, and quoting scriptures, brothers and sisters, still doesn't mean that you understand the scriptures. What we have to understand, if he's telling us to put some things away, what exactly is he saying put away? See, we got to get to a deeper study of God's words when we are reading the scriptures to make improvement to our own lives. So, so when we look at these words, let all bitterness, well, what is bitterness? If I don't know what bitterness is, well, how am I going to let it, let it all be put away from me? How am I going to divorce it if I don't know what I'm supposed to divorce? So bitterness, what is, is it? Bitterness is settled resentment or hate. You, you know, it's settled resentment. Somebody or something uh, has happened to you and now it is just settled in your heart and you now built up some hate in your life, which then leads to wrath. Well, what is wrath? Well, what happens is if this individual or this thing or this person that has upset you, as you has caused you to be bitter, now there's this outburst. See, wrath is actually, it's bitterness in action. Wrath. You're bitter, and now you're, you're like an erupting volcano. Wrath. You're just angry. It's an outburst. And the outburst happened because you were bitter. So then he goes on, he says, in anger. Look at that. He says, that all bitterness, wrath, and anger. Anger. Emotional antagonism. It, it, it's a seething anger. An anger which eventually seeks revenge. That's what he's talking about. Uh, an anger that seeks revenge. You did me wrong. I've cried out. And now I'm going to take matters into my own hand. This happens in families. Believe me. Families do this to each other. Church families do it to each other. And so it, 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 it's, it's, it's this, it's this seething revenge. I'm, I'm seeking revenge because you've done me so wrong. And then he says clamor. Look at the word there, clamor. You see that word clamor. Uh, this is a, a, an anger, a, an outburst that has no restraint. It, it, it's what we call, oh man, he's having a temper tantrum. That's where, our word, that's where that word comes from, a temper tantrum. Yelling and screaming. Yeah, that, that's what's clamor is. It's an outburst where you now cannot control yourself. It is just uncontrollable. Clamor. That's what that word means, okay? He says, you got to get rid of this clamor, this outburst. Control yourself. Remember, one of the fruit of the Spirit is, is self-control. Brothers and sisters, we've got to learn to control ourselves, and that would include in your family, not just at your job, not just at Walmart, not just when you come to church. Control yourself in your family. Clamor. And then he says, evil speaking. Because a lot of times it leads to abusive language. Uh, putting people down, cursing each other out, abusive language. That's what you, it leads to. And then he says in verse 31, Ephesians 4, 31, and he says, with all malice, maliciousness. That, that, you know what? That includes everything that he has just said. See, what he's showing here in Ephesians 4, 31 is a progression when you don't deal with, with anger. When you don't deal with, you have this unresolved anger, he's showing here a progression of what it does. See, ma malice there is the motive. That's what malice is. That's why the law says, man, with, if what he did, was he being malicious? That's, that's the idea. Maliciousness. And so you've allowed this anger, unresolved anger, to build up, and now it's progressed to a point to where now you are malicious. Now your motives are showing. This is why you acted the way you act. This is why you did what you did. And so Paul says, you got to put this away from you. Now, that's the negative. Now, how do I do it? See, again, we always know what we shouldn't do, but how do I do it? How do I do that? Look at verse 32. You be, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's how you do it. That's what you should do. That passage right there, I believe, in my opinion, is one of the most important passages for the family in the Bible. That verse right there will 
allow you to have peace in your home and in your life. If I'm kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, for God, for Christ's sake, and forgiven me. Keep your eye on Jesus. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Focus on Christ. All right, that's the first enemy. Second enemy I want to talk about tonight is the enemy of drunkenness. Go back to Genesis chapter 9. The enemy of drunkenness. You know, there are people who have problems in their family. And I'm going to tell you, they turn to alcohol and turn to drugs. It's a, it's a crying shame and it's destroying families. It really is. And people always go, is it wrong to drink? You know, people always go, yeah, well, it could be for you. Everybody worried about, is it wrong to drink? You might not shouldn't be drinking. And that's not even the issue, is it wrong to drink? What are you drinking for? Why are you drinking? Why do you want to drink? What's the big deal about drinking alcohol? You think you're more of a man or a woman because you drink? Why do you want to drink? That's the question you need to be asking. So when God was going to destroy it, he did. He destroyed the whole world because of their evil thoughts and imagination. When the world was so wicked, the Bible said Noah found grace. Noah builds the ark according to God's design. Uh, uh, him and his family gets on the boat, and I'll say yes while I'm in that neighborhood. If anybody ought to know that you're a man or a woman of God, it ought to be your family. I'll keep saying that till I die. The whole world didn't get on the boat, but Noah's family sure did. His family got on the boat. And so if nobody else believes that you're a man and a woman of God, it ought to be your family. Stop trying to impress everybody else and make everybody else think your religion or your family. Don't look at you and say, man, sit down somewhere. Woman, sit down somewhere. Now, I know I said something there. Now, in Genesis chapter 9, so what happens is they get off of the boat in Genesis chapter 9, and look at verse 20. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Jacob took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, went backward, covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant, and a servant shall he be unto his, unto his brother. And so what I want you to notice here is, you know, what Noah did, he got drunk. That's what he did. He got off the boat, he got drunk, and it caused problems in his family. It caused problems with his children. That's what it caused. It caused problems in the home. You know, again... Again, I don't tell anybody you can't drink, but I'm going to tell you something. You start drinking, so you need to leave. If you're drinking, leave it alone. And when, but if you're drinking and you act out out of character, you're going to be held accountable to God for whatever consequences you did in your drunken stupor. Please understand that. You're going to give an account for everything you do. If you're drinking and you, your drinking gets out of control, you're going to be held accountable. Look at Proverbs chapter 20. Some of us worry about just drinking. I want to know why you're so concerned about wanting to drink. That's what you need to be asking yourself that. What makes you want to drink? You ain't drinking because you're thirsty. I mean, again, I'm not telling anybody to say it, but you get drunk and you act out, you're going to have to deal with, with God on it. Now, this is what the Bible said in Proverbs verse 21, 20 and verse 1. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a marker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby it's not wise. That's all I'm telling you. It's not wise. All I can tell you is what God said. It's not, it's not wise. If you're drinking, can't control yourself. It's not wise. Go to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23 and, and verse number 29. Go to Proverbs 23 and look at me in verse 29. It's another enemy, brother. So it's destroying home. Alcohol, people can control their alcohol, destroy their lives, their kids' lives, their, their family lives, other people's lives, because they're drunk and driving, just, just crazy, acting crazy. Behind and blind and as full as weed. And these young people with this weed, you, you need to teach your kids, leave that weed alone. You, you ain't smoking no weed for no medicinal purpose. You need to start teaching your kids. This weed has got our kids losing their mind. And not just the kids, some of these old people too. Losing your mind. 
buying some wheat. It's crazy. It's ridiculous what we're seeing in the families. Some of us parents letting our kids smoke it. Well, it's just a plan, oh, man, man. but ain't making them come to church. Proverbs 23 and verse 29. Bible says this, Proverbs 23 and verse 29. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who have contentions? Who have battling? Who had wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Hey, you know, look at all these questions you Who has all these problems? Look what he says. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth self aright. Why? Because at the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Y'all see that? In other words, eventually it'll destroy you. That's all you gravitate to, and 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 I got a drink. I got to have my drink. Oh, he and she got my last nerve. I need a drink. All that kind of foolishness. Oh, how about go pray and read your Bible? That's what you do. Don't be looking for Jack Daniels and wine coolers. And so a lot of homes are destroyed because of alcohol, drunkenness, whether it be weed, or even prescription drugs. Why? You know, I'm going to tell you something. The Church of Christ members, we're not immune to, to that because you're a Church of Christ member. Go to church on Sunday and know the five steps of worship. Many of us know family members and, and are touched by members that we know who are dealing with drugs and alcohol, prescription drugs. So I'm, back, so I'm trying to put our head in the sand acting like it's unreal. Some of you on here are probably dealing with it probably dealing with this same kind of stuff. And so we need to make sure that we understand it's an enemy. Getting drunk is an enemy. Go to Romans 13 and 10. Romans 13 and 10. Romans 13 and 10. Well, it says we got to be real. Got to read our mind. Be real, man. The devil, the devil's real. He ain't holding nothing back. Now look at Romans chapter 13 and verse number 10 with me. This is what Paul writes to Christian. He says, love working no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now is the high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Get this. Not in rioting. And drunkenness, not in chambering and wantingness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What are you saying, Paul? Remember, he's writing to Christians in Rome. Paul says, when in Rome, don't do what the Romans do. If what the Romans are doing is contrary to God's will. When in Rome, don't do what they do. Wake up. All right, thirdly, thirdly, another killer. Go back to Genesis 16. Another enemy of the family is the enemy of lack of faith, brothers and sisters. It's the enemy of lack of faith. You remember in Genesis, God had promised Abram and Sarah that they were going to have a child. Back in Genesis 12, he had promised them a child. Uh, and they get older and older, and they don't see nothing happening, and they start, what they start doing is trusting and leaning on their own understanding. That's what happens. Well, this can't possibly happen. We're getting old. So they concocted their own plan. Actually, Sarah, she initiated it. Sarah initiated the plan in Genesis chapter 16. Hey, hey, husband. Hey, honey. Uh, you know, we got a servant here named Hagar. You know, why don't you take her and marry her, and then... We have a child for her, and she'll be the child of promise. Man, yeah, lack of, you know what caused all that? Lack of faith. And now, guess what lack of faith is going to do? It's going to cause all kind of problems in the family. That's what it does. Lack of faith causes problems, issues in your family. Look at verse 1, Genesis 16, 1. Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, bearing no children. She had a handmaid, Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray you, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. Abraham, hark here's a problem. Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Now, again, he's not teaching you can't listen to your wife. 
but you don't listen to your wife when she's coming up with something foolish, and that's vice versa too. When you start talking and saying stuff that's not of faith, I am not listening to you. I don't care if you're a husband, wife, or no, no children. That's what he should have But he listened to her. Now look what happened. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eye. Yo, here's a problem now. Here's a problem. Now this woman who's pregnant with child, now she's looking at Sarah. A different. And now look at verse 5. And Sarah said to Abraham, oh, here we go. Here's some problems. My wrong be upon you. Oh, your fault now, Abraham. Yeah, it's on you. I've given my maid into your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and you. There you go. Yeah, you brought all this force on yourself because you didn't live. Lack of faith. Yeah, that's why she nagging. Hey, Amen. But Abraham said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in your hand. Now look at the weakness. Do to her as it please you. And when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her faith. Look at all the problems it caused. Lack of faith caused all these kind of problems. They came up with their own standard of authority their own way of doing things his god's authority is disrespected and now you have all these problems so brothers and sisters all i'm saying is lack of faith in your home will cause problems trust god seek the kingdom of god and his righteousness first and just trust that everything else will be added up to you see when you turn from god's will let me tell you something brothers anything can happen anything can happen when you turn away from God's will, when you come up with your own concoction of how to solve your problems and leave God out of the equation. Finally, finally, I'll leave it with this. The fourth enemy we want to be on guard for and, and, and be watched men and watch women for is the enemy of dishonesty. That's another enemy. Being dishonest in your relationship. You know, when you look back at Abraham's life in Genesis 12, I, I do want to look at that. Go back to Genesis 12. You know, Abram, and he's the father of faith. I love that the Bible shows us, even though he's a father of faith, his faith had to grow. And in Genesis 12, what happens here is God is going to send Abraham to Egypt uh, with Sarah, who is really his half-sister, but more than that, she's his wife. And so Sarah was a beautiful woman, so beautiful that Abram was afraid that when he got into Egypt, that what would happen is the men over there would take, would kill him to take her. And so what he does is he lies, and still being honest. He lies to them about who Sarah is to him. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 10, the Bible says that there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt, Genesis 12, 10, to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah's wife, now he told to the borderline of Egypt, they gonna stop her, and he gonna have a conversation with her. He said, Behold now, and you imagine this conversation, I know that you're a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see you, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they'll kill me, but they will save you alive. So now what he wants to do is he wants to be dishonest. He, and he, he puts her in this plan of dishonesty. And so when you read it, it comes causes problems it's going to cause issues in egypt but not only does he do it does it once when you turn to genesis 20 he's going to do it again just in a different place a different land go to genesis chapter 20 and what i want to show you here is dishonesty breaks relationships brothers and sisters dishonesty can it ruins relationships you've got to be honest in your relationships you got to be honest with your husband, honest with your wife, honest with your children, honest with yourself. you got to be honest. And so in Genesis chapter 20, he goes to, to Gerar, is really where he goes, a different place. But he's, again, he has the same type of fear, and he tells the same type of lie. Look with me in Genesis chapter 20, and look in verse number 8. Look in Genesis 20 and verse number 8. The Bible says, therefore, a Babylon rose early in the morning. Now, let me tell you what happened, because I think I picked up in the middle of this. What happens is he gets to this place, Abraham again, and he lies to Abimelech. And these people got a lot of respect for Abraham. As a matter of fact, they got respect for him. And so well, he lies to Abimelech about Sarah. And so what Abimelech has done, he's taken Sarah into his house. Hadn't slept with him. 
Now make sure we understand it. In neither case did any of these guys, they didn't sleep with her. God prevented it, prevented that from happening. But what I want you to see is that he lies again before Isaac is even born. And so in verse 8, therefore Babylon rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all the things in their ears and the men were so or afraid because God gave Abimelech a dream. Hey, you took this man's wife. And he's like, man, Lord, I didn't know this was his wife. He told me something different. God said, yeah, I know he told you something different. That's why I'm not going to kill you. And so God prevented Abimelech from sleeping with Sarah. He's scared. But Abimelech tells everybody else about the situation. Abimelech lets all these people know around him how, how dishonest Abraham was. Now look at this, verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What have y'all, what have I done? Or what have you done unto us? And what have I offended you? That thou may that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin. He says, Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? He said, What did you see in me to make you to believe you had to be dishonest? We have, a, we have a great relationship. Why do you feel you have to be dishonest and bring all this sin on us? And Abraham said, because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. See, he told a half truth. But a half truth is a half lie. That's the problem. A half truth is a half lie. And so he was not being honest. And so what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, and it, it broke his relationship. It did. He get him out of here, man. Bye. Get on out of here. Get out of here. Take your stuff. Take this. And bye. Get out of here. It broke the relationship. Now, I'm going to tell you, it breaks relationships, family relationships, being dishonest. It, it, breaks, it breaks relationships. When you're not being honest in a relationship, it's an enemy, brothers and sisters. And so we've got to get to the point where, where, where you, you tell the truth. You be honest in your relationship. We as Christians are not to be liars. Go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Yeah, it'll destroy your family. It'll destroy it. And, uh, and God hates it. Colossians chapter 3. This is the last enemy. This is the lie. Dishonesty. Colossians 3 and 9. Uh, Paul writes to Christians. Go, go to verse 8, Colossians 3, 8. But now you also, talking to Christians, but now you also put off these. We already talked about it in Ephesians. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. And then verse 9, lie not one to another. See, you have put off the old man with his, with his deeds. You know, one of the things that's listed in Revelation 28 of going to hell is the liars. The liars are listed in the in the people uh, that will be cast uh, into into the lake of fire. And so you want to do everything that you can, brothers, as much as possible, you and sisters, you know, to get rid of anything in your life that may cause people to believe that you're dishonest. That's what you want to do. Your family and, and, and even your even the church members that you fellowship with, you 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 labor with. You want to try to rid yourself from any inclination in their hearts or minds that you are a dishonest person, that what you're doing is not out of honesty, that you're being dishonest. Let me give you an example. I, I wasn't going to talk, but let me give you an example. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians 8. One example, I'm in, I will be done. 2 Corinthians 8. Remember Paul was going to travel around to the various churches to collect the monies uh, for the collection for the dirt, the famine that was in Jerusalem. So you had various congregations that were were setting aside money uh, so that when Paul would come to take the collection, there would need be one taken up because the money would already be there. But and so Paul's gonna have this money to take back with him to the Christians that would have the need. But I want you to notice, let me find this real quick. I, I like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8. Let me find it. I wasn't planning on talking about this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, look with me at verse 20. Because Paul wanted the saints in Corinth to know that he was going to handle things in honesty. And so in verse 20, he says, 
avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. He says, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You see that? So Paul said, you know, I'm avoiding whatever it is that will cause me to look or be perceived as dishonest, not just in the sight of God. Paul says, I also want to avoid it in the sight of men. So your family needs to see you as being being an honest individual. You shouldn't be hiding stuff, hiding, keeping stuff away from your family. Because I'm going to tell you, eventually the devil will use it to destroy your family. So we got to walk in wisdom, brothers and sisters. That's all I'm saying. Let's use wisdom in our family. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which guides us in all truth. Uh, help us, dear God, to, to be watchmen, watch women. Uh, help us to be on our guard, be sober, be vigilant. For the adversary of the devil is a roaring lion. He walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The Father Peter also tells us in that same chapter, 1 Peter 5, that we are to resist him by standing steadfast in the faith. Help us, dear God, to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us, Father, to watch for our souls as we also watch for the souls of our family. Help us understand that the family is a great institution because, Father, what we do now as a family has an effect on our children and our children's children and their children's children. And marriage and family is to, to show the image of the relationship, the ministry of reconciliation. And so, Father, if we don't know how to get along with Christ in our lives, if we're fussing and fighting and, and have unresolved anger who profess to know the Lord, Lord, how can we help those? And how could, Father, we even believe that those without you can even make it? Dear God, help us. We thank you in advance for the power and the strength that you've given us, all of us who have the spirit of Christ in us by being obedient to the gospel. And Father, I pray we will not beat ourselves up about our past mistakes if we made them, and we all have. But what we need to do is we need to now learn, ask for forgiveness, and do better today than we did in the past. Help us to live better in the future that we might have better tomorrows. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I'm going to open this up for uh, any Bible questions anybody might have. Uh, so if you have any question or comment, uh, I'll go ahead and open it up at this time. Uh, brother Green, go ahead, my brother. I just want to start out by saying, Brother Steve, it's a wonderful lesson, wonderful lesson, brother. And thank God for you for bringing this lesson. You know, I was uh, listening to the part where you were talking about the drunkenness and the things that it can cause. And one of the things that I've learned in my life that a lot of times, you know, and I'm not saying this is for everybody, but a lot of times when people choose to drink or do drugs, uh, there's two reasons that I've always found. One is as a crutch, you know, to try to, in their minds, think that it's helping them get through something. And the other one is for an escape because they don't want to deal with the situations and the problems or whatever it may be that's uh, going on in life at that time. And, and one of the things I learned about that, that there is a strong possibility that when you use those mood changing, mind altering substances, that you know, you'll tend to do something that'll make it worse. And when you do sober up or whatever, now you find yourself in a worse situation that you were beforehand because of whatever you may have said or done when you were in that state. And I share that with the brethren on here tonight to let them know, you know, that that's not the way to go. Like you said, you know, pray, read your Bible, do do something, but you know, trying to turn to drugs or alcohol to to deal with problems or to escape from them problems or whatever reason it may be that you're using them is it's really a bad thing because you know it can make a situation worse. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that it only takes, it, 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 it only takes, you know, it'll take everything it possibly can from you and possibly even if your life 
So I'm just sharing that with the brethren on here for somebody that they may know that may struggle with that problem, you know, something that they can share with those people that hopefully it can help. Because, I mean, life is going to be life and it's going to be there. And, and I do like the fact that you, you stressed it and saying that we need to learn how to deal with those things, but deal with them the right way. You know, and thank you again for this lesson. My Amen. Amen. A scripture to uh, solidify what you have just said is Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, where Paul says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And we often use this scripture talking about this is why we don't use instruments. And that's true. We do sing. I, I do. I get that. But the, the, the context of this is actually uh, an individual responsibility. You know, you, your responsibility is when you when you go through life's trials and troubles that you need to be wise. You know, and, and you don't resort to alcohol and drinking. Uh, to get rid of your problem, you, you let the spirit you find you a song. You better have a midnight hour song. That's what you better have, like Paul and Silas. Because life, you, you're going to have to face the prisons of life. It, it ain't no alcohol. All you need to be turning to. You better find you a song to sing. You better open up that Bible and pray and, and uh, listen to God. Be wise. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't make no provisions for the flesh. So thank you for that, Brother Green. Brother uh, Walter Lee. Brother Walter Williams. Uh, good evening, brother. Thank you for another wonderful lesson. Um, I got a question about uh, pertaining to forgiveness. Uh, we read in Ephesians 4 and 32 where it says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake have forgiven us. Um, I was trying to locate the scripture where God was telling his people that your sins are forgiven and I remember them no more. I think about them in the parts of Egypt from the West and I remember them no more. But then I hear a lot of people expressing uh, thoughts like, I forgive you or I forgave him, but I can't forget, you know. And I, I, I have a problem with that. You know, how could you honestly forgive somebody but then you don't forget about the situation because it seems like to me when you see that person again you know that that thought will come to your mind so have you really is there really a thing of forgiveness without forgiveness could you elaborate on that for me brother yeah yeah there he is uh let me i'm trying to find this i want to say it's in jeremiah there, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate this and be, be short as I can. Uh, somebody may can find it before I find it there. I want to say, let me, I know what the Hebrew writer talks about it too. Let me see. The Hebrew writer mentions it, but he makes reference to the Old Testament. So I can find it in the, in the, in the New Testament and go back to the Old Testament. Uh, yes, or I will be merciful. There. Go to, uh, Go to Isaiah 43 and verse 25. Somebody put Hebrews 10, 17. Okay, let's use Hebrews 10, 17. Somebody put that one in the thing. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 17. Where, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You know, and, and, and he's actually making reference to the Old Testament. It is also in the Old Testament as well, what the Hebrew writer is quoting. Oh, now here, here's the thing. To, to, to forgive does not mean you have to forgive. It doesn't mean that God forgets. When we're talking about forgiveness, forgiveness is that I am not going to uh, hold the penalty uh, against you, uh, what you've done to me. See, it's impossible to, you know, to, to, to forget. I mean, there's, 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 there's just can't, it's just impossible. God is not asking us in that sense, forget as in, and as if to erase it from your mind or or to, to make like it never happened because it did happen. God's never asking us to not be real uh, and, and to live in reality. But what he's dealing with is you have to have a different spirit uh, about the situation. See, 
you and I, we, we should remember some things that we used to do. I forgot all the things I used to do, how I used to live, and, and that helps me to know that I, where I should be. And yeah, that is dead. Uh, but because of the forgiveness of God, you know, and that God is not holding that against me. God knows what I've done too. So his remembrance ain't that he just chose to erase it from his mind. All he's chosen to do is, I'm not going to hold it against him because I see the, the, the godly sorrow and I look at the blood of my son, which gave him and her new life when there was godly sorrow. So don't live life, brothers and sisters, thinking that forgiveness means that you don't have to ever remember what somebody did to you. You know, whether you were molested, whether somebody robbed you or stole something from you. But I have to have the spirit that when they've asked for forgiveness, that's key. When they've asked for forgiveness, that I have a forgiving heart. That I'm not going to hold it against you and we're going to move on. Okay, and I hope that helps. Maybe we have to do it. Yeah, Jeremiah 31, 34. Thank you. That's really what I was looking for. Because that's what Hebrew writers making reference to about this new covenant. So did that help, Brother Walter? I'm hoping they did. So he's not saying you have to forget it in the sense I act like I never know. Right, they did something to me. <laughs> you look at, oh, they didn't. And somebody said, yeah, yeah, she robbed me. And then you now you, oh, you robbed me? You don't have to play no. Yeah, you know, yeah, you robbed me. And, uh, but you got forgiveness. But I'm not holding it against you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Brother Coffin, and Sister Hernandez. Uh, yes. I, I just also have a comment. Thank you for the lesson tonight. Um, what, I'm, what I'm finding, um, brother, is when we talk about anger or situations that that may occur amongst the brethren, I'm noticing that there's an, an anger or an attitude of really not wanting to hear God's truth about it, about how to resolve and move forward. You know, you know, I've been in Lord's Church now for about five years and, and I've I was talking to Brother Green, I was for the first time of all the studying and teaching that I've been learning, I taught the well I had to respond to the marriage and divorce situation on Sunday. And boy did it light up some fireworks. But you give them scripture, you take your time and rightly divide the scriptures, and there was an anger because there was many comments that were made that were not, there were no book, chapter, and verse with these comments. You know the comments that they make. And you just have to just wonder, how, how can one be seeking truth if what you're saying, we can't find it? So and then there was a, an anger behind it. It wasn't an anger um, that reached the level of sin, but you can just see this attitude and this passion. I just said, well, because someone taught you this, but you can't find the teachings in the scriptures. That's just my comment. So it's just unfortunate, but again, that's what we just have to deal with at times. Right, and that's exactly what James is talking about in James chapter one. You know, there are people and they got their mind made, that's why they were angry with Jesus. But this is why James says what he says in James one nineteen. He said, what? Before my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. He says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. This context is talking about how one hears God's word. That's what he's talking about. There will be people, when they hear God's word, they are not swift to hear. They're not slow to speak because they're hearing something that goes contrary to what they believed or how they were taught. And so what happens is they get angry. They get angry about it. They're not slow to wrath. And so that's why you have all the outrage, the outburst, emotions kick in. You hear people all the time, one thing we don't talk about, we don't talk about religion and politics. It's, what do you mean? We don't talk about religion and politics. Well, we just agree to disagree. No, we can't, can't agree to disagree. And so we have to be slow to getting angry. We need to be swift to hear, slow to speak. That's what you have to be. And listen to God's word with meekness because it's able to save your soul. And yeah, that's it. And some people are just going to get mad, brother, but keep teaching. Uh, Sister Hernandez. Yes, uh, Brother Henry, it's a very great, another great lesson is lift up my spirit, my soul, whatever you have, you know, is 
you hear from me a lot. Thank God for you and, and pray God to give you a long life to continue doing this. And, sure. uh, can you please elaborate on First Corinthians uh, nine and nine, right? And verse nineteen to twenty-three, talking about uh, I do as uh, you know what you're talking about, but uh, the preacher said like you have to do like Roman do, and I tell him no, it's not so. Paul doesn't mean that. I hear you mention that. That's why I said, let me bring it across for you to elaborate and, uh, about yeah. it. Right. And what Paul is dealing with in First Corinthians nine is is the rights that that Christians have, uh, in, in particular himself, uh, to be paid as an evangelist. You know, that's what he's dealing with. There. He has the right uh, to be paid by the Corinthians for his labor, his spiritual labor. And so he starts talking about how you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And so, but but what Paul is dealing with in this context, what he chose to do, because it bothered them so much, uh, uh, some had a bad idea about his apostleship, Paul says, you know what, I'm not going to take the money from y'all. Even though I got the liberty, even though it's my right uh, to be paid as an apostle, Paul said, because you perceive me different, because it bothers you, Paul says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give up this right. Now, 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 we'll read the scripture you just brought up. See, that's why context is so important. So he says, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant all of men that I might gain the more. That's what he's dealing with. He says, I'm free from all men, but if, if me not taking money from you will help you be better, Paul says, I'm going to make the sacrifice. So he says in verse 20, and unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things for all men, that I might by all means save some. That was his promise. Now, Paul never said this, that he practice sin so they can win people. I became a prostitute so I can win the prostitutes. That's ridiculous. The Bible never teaches that. I became a Baptist so I might win the Baptist. Foolishness. That's a bunch of foolishness. That's not even the context. All he's saying is I met people where they were. I met them where they are so that I can teach them. That's all he's saying there. You meet people where they are. Don't go and be no sinner so you can win sinners. Imagine. About this foolishness going on in the church. I'm going to the strip club so I can win the strip clubs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, yeah, you, that's okay. You play that game with the Lord. You're gonna find yourself in hell where you're gonna find yourself. You don't do that kind of fool. I'm going in. I'm going in there to witness. Yeah, you, can, you can wait. Wait till they come out of the club, man. You want to witness? You, you little devil. Yeah, that, that's just demons. That's the money. That's why we gotta listen to the voice of God. Me and something else, brother sister. I want you to understand. People are something else. When they want to do something, they something else. Yeah, I'm a, I smoke weed so I can win the weed. Me, but smoke weed. I became like them so I can win. You know, I, I'm going to say this. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because this is what some of our brothers are pulling off too. Talking about this is why some of, and again, you don't have to wear a suit to church. Don't get me wrong. You don't have to wear a suit to church. But now you got these preachers from my, I'm, pre, I'm, I'm going to dress like the people I'm trying to win. That kind of fool. I'm so tired of hearing fools in the church. I'm going to dress like the young people. Had earrings so I can win the young people. Now that, that's so stupid. Ridiculous. You, you're going to be preaching to everybody. You don't just preach to the sinners. We, the gospel is preached to sinners and the saints. That's who the gospel is preached to. It's not one saint always saved. So you got to dress like a young person so you can win the wrong person. What kind of foolishness we got going on in the church today? I'm not wearing a suit because I want to preach. I want to I want to look like the people I preach to. Bunch of foolishness. We need to wake up. Foolishness going on in the church. Bunch of fool. I want to see him dress like a, a prostitute man. Man, want to, is he trying to win them? I wonder if he gonna do that. I wonder if he gonna dress like a drag queen. I'm trying to win them. This is ridiculous. Brother Green, go ahead. Let me. Go ahead, Brother Green. <laughs> yeah, my brother, it's, it's, it's all questions open at this point because I, I don't want to... Um, 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, bro. It's Kingdom Family. I went on to the left. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Whatever question. Yeah, uh, the question that I, I want to ask, me and Brother Robinson was discussing this earlier today. And uh, the question is, uh, the Lazarus that we read about in uh, Luke chapter 16, is that the same Lazarus that uh, Christ brought back from the dead? Yeah, and I would say no to that you know, for the simple fact that the Lazarus that we read about, the brother of Martha and Mary, uh, we don't see him in the gospel as being a beggar. You know, he has a home. He, he, they live in Bethany. Uh, we don't see him with sores. And so this Lazarus in Luke 16, that was in Abraham's bosom, is a Lazarus that's really laid at the gate with sores. Uh, and he's begging for crumbs to fall from a rich man's table. And so I don't see that Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, whom Jesus rose from the dead, fitting uh, as, as the man that we read about in Luke 16. Thank you for that question. I hope that that helps anybody. If any, anybody have any other thoughts on that? You know, I'm not the master teacher. I tell y'all that all the time. I mean that. Y'all help me when I'm wrong and stuff. Please, don't just be on here listening. And if I say something crazy and y'all, well, he said something crazy. That's Brother Henry. No, Brother Henry is not above reproach. I am not Jesus. Please, if I say something that's off, please let me know. I'm trying to go to heaven, too. I'm going to go to heaven. All right. Anybody have anything I else? Mean, Thank you, my I sister. Mean. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. I'm learning from y'all as well. We learning from each other. Anybody have anything else? Any other Bible questions? All right. Uh, any prayer requests? We're going to close out. Any prayer requests? Yes. Uh, Any prayer requests? Yes. My children are traveling to Washington, D.C. on Saturday, then coming on Sunday, and the house is going to be full. Can you please pray that, you know, <laughs> God guide? The house going to be full. Yes, yes, Sister so Amanda. We sure will. Full house. Yeah, y'all have some peace in the family. Yeah, take this lesson and study it now. Spend them four enemies. Watch out for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep, them, keep your enemies out, my sister. Uh, I saw Brother Walton and Brother Adams and then uh, Sister Williams, Peter Williams. Brother Walton. Yeah, I'd like to uh, ask you to keep my wife and myself in prayer. My wife is uh, having some health issues right now, and I'm asking the saints to uh, lift her up in prayer. Amen. God bless you, Brother Williams. Spiritual leader, brother. Let's turn about his bride. Boy, I tell you. We're going to have you to teach the next lesson, and you keep on with that. You know, <laughs> you're going to teach some less lesson on family, not ask some prayer for your wife. Uh, brother Adams. Yeah, good evening, brother. Uh, excellent lesson, Brother Henry. Appreciate that, sir. Uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Illinois. My uh, stepfather's in the hospital. I'm here with my mother, and uh, they're transporting him to a uh, rehab facility. I just pray that uh, he gets strong enough to be able to go home soon. Okay, my brother, we sure will. And God bless you, Brother Adams. And we continue to pray for John and, yes, and your brother. I didn't mention him, God but uh, yes, sir. You know, amen. 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 We sure will. Uh, Sister Williams, Vera, Vera, Vera Williams. He said more prayer for my, my legs. Um, they hurt all the time, and I want prayer. Okay, my sister. We definitely keep you in prayer, Sister Williams. I'm glad to, glad to have you on tonight, my sister, okay? Glad to have you on. I want to say this before we close out. If you're not a member of the Lord's Church, you haven't obeyed the gospel, it's very important that you ask whatever questions you need to ask concerning your soul salvation to, to get your soul saved. Good people don't go to heaven, saved people do. Please get that. Good people don't go to heaven, saved people do. And these lessons that we teach on Tuesday will do you no good. If you hadn't obeyed the gospel when you close your eyes on this side of heaven, okay? Hear the gospel, hear that Jesus died for you, believe it, repent of your sins, confess with your mouth, not your sins, just confess. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he's the Lord. And then you get baptized in order by a male member of the Church of Christ. And we'll do everything we can to make sure that happens tonight. We baptize on any day that ends with why. And uh, so you don't have to wait. There's no voting on you. You just let us know, hey, I'm not saved. I want to be saved. I believe Jesus died for my sin, and I know if I died right now, I'm not in the family of God. Let us know that. Let whoever invited you to this Zoom know that. And we'll do all that we can to, to make sure that the Lord will spare your life, pray for you, and that you will get into that water before it's everlasting too late, okay? If
If you got any questions on that subject, just please let us know. And just hold us accountable to give you book, chapter, and verse uh, to everything that we said as it relates to your salvation for your soul, okay? All right, if there's nothing else, uh, I do want to mention this. Today's Sister Valeria's birthday. Yay! She'll get on me later, but hey, happy birthday, Sister Valeria. Uh, Sister, Brother Donald's wife, and just so glad uh, she's able to be on tonight. Amen. Yeah, happy birthday, my sister. We pray God bless you with many, many more, our sister. We, we love you dearly and all your faithfulness and your work uh, that you do there at the Goose Street Church of Christ. You and Brother Donald. We'll keep him in prayer as well, as we know he's traveling, okay? All right, nothing else. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, again, this time you've allowed us to study your word. These kingdom family studies, Father, are so important. Because our Father has already mentioned, the devil is busy. But Father, we will fight. We'll fight for our families, our children, our children's children, until this world can no longer afford us a home. Dear God, be with our sister Hernandez. We'll have family traveling to her. Just pray, Father, that uh, your spirit, your love will be with this family as they unite together. Pray that they'll make it safely. They'll enjoy the time uh, that they'll spend together, Father God. And just pray that, Father, you'll get all the praise, honor, and glory. Thank you for our brother Williams, that God is concerned about his wife, our dear sister Williams. Thank you for what they both mean to us, dear God, their example. Although I hadn't seen them face to face, dear God, it's like I've known them, uh, Father, for many, many years. Uh, and Father, I just pray you continue to bless these, these two individuals, their great example of love and faith that they've shown to us on this Zoom study. And I'm sure, Father, many others that they congregate with. We've heard the reports from our sister Vera Williams about how loving they are and how they've taken care of her. They've been there for her, dear God, which had a lot of influence on her being where she is even on today. And so, Father, bless the Williams family, our brother and our sister Williams. Father, be with our brother Adams, who also is away, uh, Father, with his wife, uh, and uh, Father, his, his stepfather was in the hospital. Dear God, you know all about it. Be with the doctors, be with the nurses, anybody who plays a part in his stepfather's physical well-being, dear God, we pray that you give him wisdom. And thank you for Brother Adams, dear God, what he means to us, his faithfulness, his love, and his concern uh, for not just himself, but Father, for his family as well. Strengthen he and brother and his sister, my sister Adams, Father, in the faith as they continue to do your will. And for our sister Vera Williams, Father, who's having problems in her legs, Father God, we just pray you give her healing. Pray to Father, you'll give her strength. I pray, Father, that you'll give her peace. And Father, we know that you're able to heal her legs and to give her comfort. We're not talking to a God who can we're not praying to a God that we don't believe it's possible. But Father, so we're asking you, Father, give our sister healing in her legs. Father, I pray you will strengthen her. Hold up on every lane inside. And I pray as she goes through this tough time that she'll continue to pray herself, knowing that she serves an all-powerful God, who is a God of all comfort, who is able to do exceedingly above, abundantly above what we ask or what we think. Now, may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest with us. And abide with us all, Father God. And Father, be with our sister Valeria. Thank you for blessing her with another year of life. And we pray you continue to bless she and her family in their efforts to serve you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, saints. Remember, our next study will be uh, Thursday, Mark chapter uh, 15. Mark 15 on Brother Green's Zoom page. Love you all. The love of God. Y'all have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.